Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. So glad to have you along with us. As we are in the studio right now midweek, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. In fact, it's kind of too nice for this time of year. As we enter the month of Rocktober, by the time you hear this show, it will be Rocktober. Now, why do I call it Rocktober? Because it's a rock and roll month. In my opinion, the best month of the year. Temperatures are usually down, and they will be as the month goes on. The colors are beautiful. The fall hunting seasons are in full swing. The fall fishing season's in full swing. And all is wonderful in the natural world. God is smiling on us during the month of October. Even when it's a rotten day with a northeast wind and a cold front coming in and the barometer dropping, it's still a wonderful time of year. Rocktober. Hmm. Uh, what's going on for me this week? I did get the boat out of the water. I was really quite nervous last week when we had those gale force winds come in and the floods on the, on, on the Saginaw River from the heavy rain. Um, it just made me nervous. I know there is some phenomenal perch fishing to be had out there. I know there's some great late season walleye action to be had. But you know what? I knew I wasn't going to take advantage of it. So I did take advantage of a break in the weather. Uh, Early last week, I ran the Angler Quest, the 826 Pro Troll, across Saginaw Bay over to Linwood Beach Marina to have her winterized. It was a nice trip, though. Those Angler Quests are such great boats. And I'm so excited now after seeing the, 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 the improvements in the design and the changes for 2022. AnglerQuestPontoons.com, AnglerQuestPontoons.com. But Linwood Beach now... Guys, you've got her, you'll take care of her, and you'll do what needs to be done, and I do appreciate that as I make the transition over to the fall hunting season. Um, By the time you hear this again, bow season will have opened. I probably will have spent some time in a tree stand. I say probably because as I'm looking forward for for the next couple of days, it's going to be so warm. If it was not October 1st, I certainly wouldn't hunt. But the fact that it's October 1st kind of makes me think that I have to be there, right? But I will be honest. It would take a very, very special buck to walk in front of me to let an arrow fly in temperatures like this. Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't go out with the intent of taking a doe right now because it's just a little bit too warm and I don't want to deal with the processing and the hassle of the meat when it's this warm. But if the right buck walked in front of me and did the right thing, meaning quartered away and put his leg forward and opened up the vitals, I might be tempted, but it would have to be a pretty good-sized buck. In preparation for the season, I've been shooting uh, my bow, and I'm still mentally making this transition from hunting the last couple of years with a recurve over to the crossbow. I am enjoying it, but it's really... It's kind of a it's kind of a mind altering experience because in the past for two years I have limited myself to a fifteen yard shot. Now, with this dart and crossbow, the uh, Toxin One Hundred Reverse Draw RD, the bow the scope is actually zeroed at forty yards. I. Um, I put a Vortex scope. The, the, the bow came with a Darton scope, and it was a very nice scope, and it was perfectly acceptable, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. So I bought myself a Vortex Crossfire 2 scope to kind of up the, uh, up the game a little bit. 
And the way that vortex is set up is you actually zero the scope at 40 yards. And then you go back to 80, which just blows my mind, and you shoot at 80 using the 80-yard reticle, the 80-yard crosshair. And if you hit low, you turn down the magnification on the scope. And if you hit high, you turn up the magnific- magnification on the scope, the power of the scope. And what does that do? What that does is allow you to fine-tune the setup for the speed of your bow so that the crosshairs, the reticles, will line up at 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. In the past, my setup has been like, okay, it's zeroed at 20, it's a little high at 30, it's a little low at 40, and it's quite a bit off at 50 or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. And it always bothered me. I didn't, well, for one thing, I, was, I, wasn't, I didn't quite know how to set up a crossbow scope, to be honest with you. And it bothered me that if I had an animal in front of me, I had to think, okay, well, where am I aiming for this distance? Well, now I know at 20, 30, 40, they line up. And I think that's, uh, to me, it's easier. Now, you said, but, you're, but you, you can hit the target accurately at 80. Would you shoot a deer at 80? Of course not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If you want to and you feel comfortable with that shot and you think you can make a quick, clean, humane killing shot at that distance, then you do what you feel is right. I would never tell you what to do. But for me, especially after, again, for the last two years not being willing to shoot at more than 15 yards, how far would I shoot a deer at? Mm, I'd like to be at 20 or 30 yards. Even with a crossbow, I'd like to be at 20 or 30 yards. Would I shoot out to 40? Yeah, I think so. 50? Oh, boy. Again, it would have to be perfect conditions. 60? No. Nope, absolutely not. So even though the gear, the tool, will make will make a shot, I'm not comfortable doing it. Big difference between sitting at my buddy's farm shooting at a target that doesn't move under ideal conditions with no stress, no wind, no ducking by the animal, no moving from the animal, and then being in a hunting situation. Again, I go back to, I think, as hunters, we need to do everything we can to be as effective and efficient as possible. But I'm really happy with this setup. It's it's actually quite impressive. Oh, what else? Somebody's asking. I'm doing a live feed right now. Somebody said, how do those uh, wreck broadheads work on, on my bear? They were devastating. And that's what I will be shooting uh, for deer as well. I love working with and promoting family-owned Michigan-based companies. That's my sweet spot. That's who I like to work with. That's who I like to promote. That's the products I like to use. And when I find products from Michigan-based family-owned companies that work very well, like those REC broadheads, R-E-K, REC broadheads, I'm going to stick with them, and I'm going to promote them. Speaking of promotions, we've got some going on right now. Primaltreestands.com. Now, they're, they're not a Michigan-based family-owned company, but they're headed by Bob Ransom, who, if you know Bob's history, started Ameristep, and that's, that's enough for me. Uh, they're Wraith 270 see-through ground blind. If you go to Primaltreestands.com and use the promo code Avery, you can get that blind for under $200. In fact, I went on there, used my own promo code, and bought a blind and had it shipped right down to Ohio to build piles of Ohio bow hunting outfitters. Everything on the website you can get a discount on, but you can get that Wraith 270 for under 200 bucks. If you go to michiganbrand.net and use the promo code Mike21, 20% off everything on the website. More on Michigan Brand coming up. And if you go to MUCC.org, use the promo code Mike, all caps, M-I-K-E, you can save 25% on your MUCC membership. I mentioned Michigan Brand uh, because they have just finished or in the process of finishing processing the meat from the bear that I shot in Ontario. 
um, brats. Bear brats on the grill are one of the most wonderful things you will ever taste in your life. Am I interested in bear steak or bear roasts? Absolutely not. Bear jerky? Yeah, you got my attention. Hunter sticks? Yeah, but bear brats on the grill are the best. Coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand will join me to talk about processing wild game, to talk about a giveaway they have coming up in conjunction, in cooperation, in partnership with the folks at Rapid River Knife Works in the UP. We will do a Wednesday night live at Rapid River on Wednesday night, October 20th. I would encourage you to join us. Also, in our number one, John Page from the Rough Grouse Society here in Michigan. It's small game season. That means squirrels, rabbits, woodcock, and grouse as well. In our number two, Mike Horswell of Jay's Sporting Goods talking about processing your own venison. If you want to do that, he's your man. Brian Roll from the DNR with some anticipation. I uh, I I think they're setting up Michigan hunters for a disappointing deer season in the UP. We'll talk about that this week's Ask Avery segment. Chad Stewart of the DNR talking about the EHD outbreak in the southern part of the state. And we're switching gears in hour number three. Lance Valentine of Teach and Fish and teachandfishing.com. If you want to target trophy walleye, this is the time of year. We'll talk about that. And Wild Game Chef Dave Miner with a great recipe. All that coming up this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on more than two dozen stations across the great state of Michigan, including WZTK in Alpena, that's 105.7 FM. You can hear us in St. Joe on WSJM 94.9 FM and north of the bridge in Newberry on WNBY 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is uh, brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. That's MUCC.org. MUCC.org. And one more time, if you want to save 25% on your MUCC membership, you can use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E, and save that 25%. While you are uh, online, I would encourage you to check out my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Then head on over to MichiganBrand.net. MichiganBrand.net, the website of Michigan Brand Meats, a company I am proud to partner with. Again, a Michigan-based, family-owned company. You know I love that. These guys are hardcore hunters and anglers as well. Nick Grillo, a good friend of mine. Uh, joins us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Nick, welcome back uh, to the show. How are you? Doing great, Mike. How are you today? I'm doing uh, real good. It's a great time of year, isn't it, Nick? It sure is, man. This fall, uh, I can't wait to get in the deer woods, and we just uh, finished up some salmon fishing these last couple weeks, so perfect time of year. Yeah, I call it I call it Rocktober because there's so much going on. Tell me about your adventures. You've been out fishing with uh, Paul Schlafly at Riverside over on the west side of the state, haven't you, Nick? Yeah, yep. We uh, fish with him all summer long, and uh, obviously when these salmon run up the river, it's my favorite time of year. I just love fighting those salmon in the river. But we um, we've gone twice these last two weeks, and we've uh, beaten the crap out of these salmon. It's <laughs> It's been awesome. Well, you know, you you get a twenty pound king out in the lake, and that's one thing. But that same fish gets up in the river, and it's it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You have the log jams. You have shallow water. Um, obviously, they're super aggressive. So it's just it's such a fight just to try to get them close enough to the boat to net. So that was like um, last week. We went six for fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome to have 15 fish on, but man, it's just <laughs> so hard to net that many fish. So we were happy to at least land those six. Are you? What are you doing? Casting crankbaits, Nick? Yeah, we're doing that for the first couple hours when they're pretty darn active, 
and then Paul switches to skein um, with those floating bobbers. And uh, we actually did have a couple bites on the crankbaits in the morning. That's and then the skein well, were pretty active. But, yeah. there, but there's nothing like having that. I mean, it, it, it's like casting for bass, but you got a 20 pound king waiting to hit it. And they just crush oh, yeah. that thing, don't they? <laughs> exactly. I had two hits in the dark, and the one pretty much yanked the rod right out of my hand. It was amazing. <laughs> and that one, I think, was a 22 or so pounder. Wow. Nick, what are you doing with that meat this time of year? Because, you know, some of the fish can be real fresh. Others aren't going to look quite as good. What are you guys doing with it? True, yeah. So a lot of our summer fish, we always throw on the grill and do, like, the salmon dinners and patties and everything. But, yeah, this time of year, we always smoke them. I think they're still good regardless if you did throw them on the grill or anything. I know some people turn their nose up to it. But for us, we do uh, chunk them and we throw them in our smokers at work and make a real good smoked fish out of it for us to have at home. Oh, I bet. And listen, the Grillo family, you guys, when it comes to processing wild game, you guys are the experts. Uh, Michigan brand meats. Tell me about the company, Nick. Yeah, so this is the perfect time of year with deer season hitting right now. Um, we are still doing our custom processing. So as you've mentioned numerous times and people know by now, we don't do whole deer processing anymore. We do the um, boned out meat. So as long as you bring it boned out, chunked up, you don't have to strip it into jerky or you don't have to grind it or anything. Just bring it chunked out and we can turn it into jerky or summer sausage, broths, snack sticks, whatever you guys want, bear meat, deer meat, elk, we make it all. Well, whatever you offer uh, commercial, commercially, you can do that for custom orders, right? And I'm thinking, again, brats, jerky, hunter sticks, burger, whatever. Correct, yep. We have a list of all the items we offer on our website, um, and the prices are on there as well. And something to remember, too, is we add 50% pork to the sausage products. So if you bring us in a pound of um, venison meat, you're going to get two pounds back because we add that 50% uh, pork back. Well, and I'm then, uh, go ahead, Nick. Sorry. And then I was just going to say for jerky, you got to remember it shrinks 50%. Um, so that's yeah. the opposite. Yeah, so keep that in mind. If you think you're going to get a certain amount of, say, if you had had an entire whitetail made into jerky, you're not going to get 50 pounds of jerky back. Correct, exactly. And uh, we've had some people do that, that turn their whole deer into jerky, and they're snacking on deer meat for the whole <laughs> deer season. <Yep. laughs> well, I'm looking forward. My uh, Ontario uh, bear should be just about done. When I came back through Michigan, I stopped by uh, Stutzman's in Clare, and they deboned it for me, and then they got the meat to you guys. And, Nick, I, I love bear meat. I'm not a big fan of bear uh, steaks or bear roast, but, man, I love bear burger. I love bear uh, hunter sticks and brats. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it, it's hard to beat bear brats on the grill, isn't it? Yeah, doesn't that just sound perfect? Bear brats, man. It, it does. <laughs> yep, so does. you got a lot of that coming back. We did that actually last week, and um, we're packaging it this week right now for you. But there's cheddar brats and the original brats. We did a bunch of them for you. And then we did some snack sticks, too. You wanted some of those. Yeah. So we have some, even the snack sticks, we put cheddar in. So you have some ch cheddar snack sticks. And then we got, I think it was like 15 or so pounds of burger that we ground up at the end for you. Excellent. Well, I got a lot of people anxiously awaiting this bear meat, Nick, so I, I appreciate that. Yep. Um, what else have you got coming up this fall? I know, I mean, you're a guy who likes to take adventures. You've been down in Florida hunting gators. You've been out in the Rockies hunting uh, mountain lions. And you had... Uh, an Ontario moose hunt that you were trying to get done this year, didn't you? Yep, yep. I was really looking forward to that one this year. And just like a lot of things, COVID threw that wrench into it. But um, the border with uh, Canada, <clears throat> he ended up selling all of his American tags less than two weeks before they announced that the border was going to be open. Mm. 
Mm. So he pushed all of us American hunters to next year. So I'll just have to wait another year to go on this hunt. <laughs> and you're going to go up and to uh, White River, Ontario. Who who will you be hunting with, Nick? Correct. So this is actually White River Air, and they are a fly-in camp. They also do drive-ins for their moose hunts. So it just kind of depends on the year if you fly in or you drive in. But they do the fishing all summer long, too, where you fly in. And Pete... Um, Pete Jones, actually, who is your wolf outfitter and who you connected me with to go on my wolf hunt as well, he actually guides moose for them as well. Oh, that's so, right. I, I forgot about that trip. You you went you went up there on a moose. Uh, I'm sorry, a wolf hunt a few years ago. Correct. Yep. I think three or four years ago now. And yep, I got my wolf hunt the first morning. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That White River uh, is is really an interesting area, and the people up there. You know, you hear stories about sometimes you go into Canada and the people aren't real friendly. Well, we haven't seen that in White River at all, have we? No. I've been up there for bear and wolf, and, again, I found all this out from you, but same experience for me. Every single person is so nice, and it's so beautiful up there. I mean, you can't ask for a better location have the bear and moose and wolves all around, and it's just perfect town. The the moose hunt, I know you haven't been on it yet, but is that a is that a gun hunt or is that a bow hunt? He actually does both, but I am going for a bow. You are? I call him in, yep, last week of September, first week of October. So it's their rut period. So you're on the ground calling and trying to butt up heads with uh, one of these moose <laughs> I've never done that. I've always wanted to. It looks like a riot, you know, calling them in at ground level, having them come in. Another thing I've never done that you have is a, a, a Rocky Mountain mountain lion hunt. Tell me more about that. Yeah, that was another once-in-a-lifetime hunt. I was very lucky to uh, be able to go on that. So last December, I went out to Colorado, and this was my first mountain hunt. So uh, I had a train running all summer long, and obviously you can't uh, train for the altitude. So when I got out there, I was trying to acclimate to the wet, or the oxygen. So taking five steps was uh, even just pretty hard to get used to. <laughs> How long did it take your body to, to, to get accustomed to the, to the altitude? To be honest, I don't think I ever did. Yeah. But um, I didn't really get the altitude sickness that people talk about but um as far as just feeling dehydrated and just harder on your joints just it it was every time i took a step you could just feel like it was weighing down on you Mm. and uh we had a mile and a half hike in when we got my mountain lion and i forget how many hours i think it took us almost three hours (laughs) because you're going over rocks and there's snow, every step is um, cactus or a rock slide where your boot slides out. So you just have to take your time and work up that mountain. <laughs> and you did get your cat. I did, yep. It was the third day of my hunt, and we got a big tom. He was a mature tom, and uh, the thing was as big as me. It was amazing. Wow. I could barely hold them up for my picture. <laughs> I've, I've seen that picture, and it's beautiful. Nick, hang tight. we got to take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. A few more things I want to follow up on, including a promotion coming up with Michigan Brand Meats and uh, the folks at Rapid River Knife Works, uh, Chris Durson at Rapid River Knife Works, rapidriverknifeworks.com. And this whole thing will wrap up at a Wednesday night live, uh, live from the Rapid River Showroom in Rapid River in the UP, where uh, we'll be giving away uh, a Rapid River knife and maybe a few other things as well. But we'll talk more with Nick Grillo. We'll wrap up our conversation with Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats, michiganbrand.net, with those those details. And I want to find out, what did that mountain lion taste like? I I have this perception, but I've heard they're excellent. Talk about that and more with Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand, michiganbrand.net, after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine.
You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Battle Creek on WBCK. That's 95.3 FM. And you can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your mid-Michigan tracker and Angler Quest headquarters. In fact, uh, my Angler Quest, my 826 Pro Troll, is at Linwood Beach right now being put to bed for the winter. Thank you guys for taking care of her. I appreciate it. For more info, check them out online at linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. Uh, talking now with a buddy of mine, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats, michiganbrand.net. Uh, Nick, that uh, that mountain lion you got in the Rockies last year, um, how how did it taste? I, I would think, you know, well, listen, I've got a perception of what I think a mountain lion would taste like, but everybody I know who's had one says they're excellent. How did you uh, How did you find it? Yeah, so I kind of heard the same thing when we were heading out there for the hunt. And obviously, being from a jerky plant, we had to make some into jerky. (laughs) But we did a little bit of everything. We did some steaks, roast, burger, chicken, um, geez, chicken, sorry, (laughs) Um, jerky. So we tried a little bit of everything. And honestly, my favorite thing out of it was the jerky. It Mm. turned out really good. Mm. Mm. But, I mean, everything out of it was actually really good. It was like a really... um, Really good pork meat is the best way to describe it. Really? Yeah, and that's what I've heard. Well, you you guys there at Michigan Brand, I mean, the, the company started out uh, as uh, processing whitetails, uh, a deer processor. You've grown into so much more than that. Um, tell me a little bit about the company these days, Nick. Yep, so like you said, we started back in the 80s as Bay City Meats. And in 1994, my dad changed the brand to Michigan brand. And that's when he went into the jerky uh, world. And he just had a gut feeling that jerky was going to take off. And luckily it did. (laughs) So um, we've been doing this jerky for years and years. And we still do some of the same sausage and uh, family recipe products that we've done since the 80s, like our hams. That's still my grandpa's recipe from the 80s. We still have some sausages like the German bologna and the Polish sausage that, like I said, we've been doing since the 80s and 90s. Well, yeah, everybody loves jerky. Even non-hunters love jerky. I mean, they uh, you, you find it at convenience stores all over the place, party stores, gas stations all over the place. And your Michigan brand hams, they are the best. We have them every holiday at the Avery House. In fact, coming up here pretty soon, we're going to give away ham for the holidays on our Wednesday Night Live. But before that, Nick, you've got a big promotion coming up with Chris Durson at Rapid River Knife Works. What are the details on that? Yeah, so like you said, Chris up there at Rapid River, um, he's got such an awesome showroom up there and such amazing products with his knives. And we were lucky enough to get our jerky in there with him this last summer. And he's got some just awesome customers that stopped through just to see a showroom, to buy his knives. So now we got jerky in there as well, so it's perfect. (laughs) But um, we are going to do a giveaway with him here for October. And we're going to start it um, this week, actually, starting Sunday when your radio show airs. And... What we're going to do is we're going to have a Facebook post, and obviously you, um, Chris over at Rapid River, and us at Michigan Brand are all going to be part of it, where you just have to like the um, the post and make a single comment. It can be your name. It can be something nice about either one of our companies. It can be a picture of a deer, whatever you want to post. And then when we do a Wednesday Night Live with you up there at Chris, um, at Rapid River, we're going to pick a random comment, and that's going to be the winner, and you're going to get one of Chris's knives. Wow. Do you? Uh, well, listen, his knives are beautiful. Do you know what one you're giving away yet, or are you still working on those details? Um, actually, I haven't talked to Chris about which one for sure, but we do want to give out an engraved knife. Okay. So you got one of your Mike Avery ones like you uh, posted a couple weeks ago. Oh, it's beautiful. But beautiful. Yeah, the 
winner will put their name right on the knife for them. It will be a custom engraved one. Uh, that'll be wonderful. So you've got to go to the uh, Michigan Brand Facebook page, the Rapid River Facebook page. If they want to go to my Facebook page, that'd be great as well. Uh, like those pages, make a comment, and then that, that's all there is to be entered to win a Rapid River knife that we will give away, you will give away, on a Wednesday night live from Rapid River Knife Works showroom on a Wednesday night, October 20th. Correct. That's all you have to do. How um, cool I cut is out that? There for a second. Are you still there, Mike? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Are you still? You, you hear me, Nick? Uh, for something on his end, obviously. All right, Nick, listen. Yep, I got you. Okay, now. yeah, we heard you the whole time, Nick. So all is good. We heard everything you were saying. Um, this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to this. We will promote this for the next few weeks. And listen, good luck to you in the Whitetail Woods. You're not going back to um, White River on a moose hunt, but you're going to be deer hunting right here in Michigan. So good luck on that. Yeah, I think he's got phone problems. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. I All do right. appreciate it. All right, Nick. I uh, appreciate that as well. Uh, uh, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meets, michiganbrand.net, michiganbrand.net. The, uh, they're on Facebook as well. And then the website for Rapid River Knife Works is rapidriverknifeworks.com, rapidriverknifeworks.com. And, of course, my uh, website, MikeAbreyOutdoors.com. We all have Facebook pages. Go to the uh, post that we're going to put up there, like it, and you will be registered to win a Rapid River Knife Work that we will give away on Wednesday, October 20th, with a Wednesday night live from the showroom in Rapid River. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, grouse and woodcock hunting right here in Michigan with John Page of the Rough Grouse Society of Michigan here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Cairo on WKYO, that's 1360 AM, and WIDL 92.1 FM. And you can hear us in Houghton Lake on the Twister, 92.1 WTWS. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Michigan-based Boning Archery. Boning has been a leader in the archery industry since 1946, and that means... 2021 is their 75th anniversary. How cool is that? Michigan-based boning, been a leader and an innovator in the archery industry since Roland Boning and invented feral tight way back in the old days. These days, boning continues to innovate, come up with new products for target archers and bow hunters. I would bet as you head to the woods this fall, there's a good chance you have boning products somewhere in your arsenal. Check them out online at boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G, boning.com. While you are online, uh, head on over to roughgrousesociety.org, roughgrousesociety.org, the online presence of the Rough Grouse Society. Uh, John Page, very active in that, and a very active and hardcore upland bird hunter with us on the Outdoor Magazine phone line now. John, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Listen, how has the early part of your season uh, been so far? Have you had a chance to get out much? Oh, I've been out uh, a fair amount, but uh, the, the woods is pretty thick yet. It's been pretty warm, but uh, in in general, uh, when I've been in good uh, house habitat, I've been finding some birds. John, are you on a speaker right now? Yeah, I am. Do I need to get off? Yeah, please, if you would. We're getting some weird stuff on our end here, and I apologize for that. Okay. Okay. Me, oh, uh, much, much better. Thank you. Uh, listen, Michigan is a is a huge state for upland bird hunting, one of the best in the country, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's definitely a destination for rough grouse and meat. Yeah. So... <laughs> Sorry, John. We're having some we're having some phone uh, problems. I apologize yeah, for that. Let me see if I can this off. Uh, maybe he's going to pull some magic. Okay, are we better now? I think I think so, John. So listen, with 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 grouse and woodcock, a lot of it comes down to habitat, doesn't it? And and this natural cycle I hear so much about. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, not a uh, trained. Uh, biologist by any stretch of the imagination, but, uh, uh, you know, habitat is certainly the most important thing for 
for all of our you know species that we like to hunt the birds the the deer the, the rabbits and uh, you know everything else and uh, you know healthy forests are a big part of uh, of what we do for our upland hunting you know, and you guys rough grouse society you are prompo- proponents of improving habitat and you work hard to do that what are the some of the, what are some of the things you guys are involved in Okay, well, over the last uh, about six years, there's been uh, oh, about 66 different projects scattered around Michigan wow. where we, you know, enhance a lot of work that's already been done by the commercial forest industry with their with their cuttings. We work very closely with the uh, DNR in places. We work very closely uh Getting more work done in the federal forests and the with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, which is, you know, for those of us that spend a lot of time in the woods, uh, we really, you know, would like to see more cutting and things in our federal forests. Why? What What does the cutting do, John? Well, the the cutting maintains a diverse age class and. You know diversity of species in out in out in our forests, and in order to maintain the forests in a healthy condition, which means that all wildlife benefits, whether it be rough grouse, whether it be woodcock, whether it be deer, whether it be bear, whether it be rabbits, that uh, and even non-game species, golden wing warbler, for instance, uh, benefits a lot from what we do. Uh, you know, the, the term we really like to use about forest management is that they need to be working forests. So, uh, there are, there are types of forests like Aspen that need to be what we call even age management or clear cuts to where when they get to a certain age, uh, they, you, you cut them and they come back really thick. So, you know, that, uh, those are some of the principles of, of forestry out there. Uh, you know, there are good hardwood stands out there that are, uh, you know, selective cutting is the appropriate thing. And, you know, those are uh, things that we at the Rough Grouse Society and members advocate that we manage our forests properly. Well, John, I'm glad you guys at the Rough Grouse Society are out there keeping an eye on such things, and I, I wish you a wonderful season. Listen, we all love these beautiful fall colors, but I know in the back of your mind you're thinking, I can't wait till those leaves drop. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right, John, have a good season. Appreciate your time. Okay, we appreciate it, and uh, I'll be back in the woods starting tomorrow. All right, John, have fun. John Page of the uh, Rough Grouse Society of Michigan, the rough, uh, the uh, website roughgrousesociety.org, roughgrousesociety.org. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, we're going to follow up on this uh, venison processing or processing your own wild game. I use the guys at Michigan Brand. I kind of take the easy way out. But if you want to have more control over it and you want to do it just the way you want to do it, Mike Horswell of Jays has some great suggestions. Then Brian Rule from the DNR talking about deer numbers in the UP and Chad Stewart with an update on the EHD outbreak in the southern part of our state in Hour 2 of Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polarcraft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to hour number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. Glad to have you along with us as we kick off the month of Rocktober. Rocktober, the best month of the year, in my opinion. Now, listen, I don't mean to be 
dissing any of the other months of the year. But there's something about October. Ooh. The best month of the year. So many things going on. The hunting seasons are in full swing. Bow season open now. Great fall fishing as well. Love the month of October. Um, you know, I mentioned the Outdoor Magazine radio show, and I do promote the fact this is a radio show. First and foremost, it is scheduled, recorded, produced, and distributed as a three-hour weekly radio show talking about the great outdoors, the history and tradition of hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping, primarily here in the great state of Michigan, but occasionally beyond. And I do think the best way to listen to Outdoor Magazine Radio, if you can, is on your local radio station. There you can get your local news, weather and sports, even your ads, a spot, some, maybe a sale, something you want to take advantage of. But isn't it nice to know that there is a podcast version of the Outdoor Magazine Radio Show available? If your local station doesn't carry all three hours or if you live in some part of our state not covered by the broadcast signal. Now, where do you hear the podcast version of the radio show? You can hear it on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. It's on my Facebook page as well. You can hear us on Amazon Music, on Audible, on my Twitter feed, on LinkedIn, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player FM, Deezer, Odyssey, and even YouTube. I know. I know, it's a radio show. Why do I put it up on YouTube? Because people watch slash listen to it on YouTube. I also do monthly podcasts for Jay Sporting Goods, Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Killer Food Plots, Polar Craft Boats, Shadow Hunter Blinds, and a quarterly podcast for the folks at MUCC, Michigan Out of Doors. Regardless, though, of how you are hearing my voice, I do certainly appreciate it. There's so much content out there these days. Podcasts and, 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 and YouTube stuff and only a couple of outdoor radio shows. But regardless of when you are listening to me, how you are listening to me, the fact that you hear my voice at all means a lot to me. I do certainly appreciate it. 40 years in broadcasting now, and I would not be able to be at this mic right now if I did not have your support and your loyalty, and I appreciate that. I was talking in the first hour with Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand, and I told you, I kind of took the easy way out, right? I, I, had, <laughs> I took the real easy way out. When I brought my bear back from Ontario, I had the folks at uh, Stutzman's um, debone it, and then they, the meat went to Michigan brand in Bay City, and they made it into brats and jerky and burger. That is a good way to do it. And for me, it is a very good way to do it because I have a great relationship with Nick and the Grillo family. But I admit I am missing a big part of this process by not processing my own wild game. There's something intimate and basic and it brings it full circle. When you go in the field, you harvest the animal, you field dress the animal, and then you process it yourself for your friends and family, that completes the experience. Mike Horswell uh, is an expert at this. I'm telling you, this guy knows this process inside and out. He just happens to work at Jay's Sporting Goods which makes it even cooler to have him here on the show because he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Mike, welcome back. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Mike. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Listen, it was nice to see you at Jay's here a couple of weeks ago for their, their 50th anniversary celebration. Hey, congrats to everybody at Jay's. That's a big deal. Yes, thank you. We're very proud of that. We're very proud of our heritage there at Jay's. We're very proud of what the Poet family has accomplished. And we're all very excited to be a big part of it. Now, and you guys, are, the Poet family tells me, and whenever I talk to them, they say, listen, our employees, whether they're new people or longtime employees like you, are a big part of this um, a success. So congrats to you as well, Mike. Thank you. Let's talk about this whole um, concept of processing your own wild game. It, it really is a wonderful experience 
and and really makes the the hunting experience something even bigger, isn't it? Yes, it's a very very important part of the hunting experience, and it's a great way to share it with family. It's just a wonderful way to bring that quality meat full circle, as you mentioned, back to the table to enjoy with family and friends. You can relive the success in the field every time you sit down to a meal. You know exactly the quality of the products that you're putting out there for your friends. It's just a a good way to complete the whole outdoor experience. How hard is it? I mean, if somebody has no background in this, how much is it going to take us to learn how to do this, Mike? Well, there's a learning curve there. Um, Most people are put off by it. It's a little bit cumbersome in the early going. I like to break it down into steps. Once you uh, achieve a system where you can break it down into steps and follow the same procedures each time, it becomes much easier. It's a lot less overwhelming when you break it down into sessions. Of course, it starts in the field with a good field dressing. You need to know how to field dress the animal. A good, clean harvest is important. Get that animal hung up. Let it drain out nicely. Okay, that's step one. I like letting it hang a couple days. Next step would be the skinning and quartering process. That takes me a solid hour and a half, two hours. If you have a buddy helping you, if you take your time, you can get the hide off that animal. You can get all the muscle groups off the bone. At that point, you've got boneless prime meat to work with. You can take a break then, maybe put it in the fridge next day break it down a little further, get it into the cuts of meat you want, get a pot of grinding meat, get your steaks and roasts separated. At that point, you could take another break, take it to the final process of your grinding your meat, making burger, making salami, put some of your cuts into jerky, whatever you want to make it into. So if you break it down into those steps and spread it out over a a few days period, it's a lot less overwhelming. It doesn't become a grind. It's not so cumbersome to get it done. For you, it's got to be second nature at this point. Absolutely. I I started doing this with my brother when we were, I was 15 years old. Uh, I believe I told you the story before about I was a boy hunting with my grandfather. He harvested a seven-point buck. We dropped it off at the local meat processor, and those guys do a great job. They're overwhelmed. They they mass-produce a lot of butchering in a short amount of time. In this case, we dropped the deer off. My grandpa was questioned by the processor, what kind of cuts would you like? What do you want it made into? Okay, they took the meat. About a week later, we went and picked it up. The gentleman grabbed a box. He took his slip. He says, okay, he opened a big deep freeze full of meat, all different kinds of cuts of meat, all different sizes, steaks, roasts, okay, from mature bucks down to fawns. And he said, well, you wanted some steaks. He grabbed a few packs of steaks. You wanted some roasts. So all the meat was put into a a big community freezer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we got some meat that was very dark, very tough from mature animals. We got some meat that was tender from other animals. So at that point, I thought, boy, it'd be nice to put the emphasis on keeping the, the animals separate. So everybody makes sure they get their meat back. I mean, that's important as hunters. When we harvest something in the field, we give it that care it deserves. We want to ensure that we get that back. And most processors I know do a fantastic job. They're very efficient. They do deliver that kind of quality. But I got to believe, unfortunately, some of the mass producing guys out there maybe just can't quite get to that level of care because of the numbers that they do. What impact, uh, let me rephrase that, what we do in the field, can that actually have an impact on the the quality of the the meat that we put on the table a few days later, several days later? Most definitely. Um, You really need to educate yourself with proper field dressing, getting the carcass cleaned out as best you can. And there's some things that are beyond your control. You know, if you've got a marginal harvest where you didn't get a recovery till the next day or if maybe some of the uh, inside of the animal and some of the organs were compromised during the harvest that can really make some bad bad situations inside you just need to to get rid of that stuff that may have become tainted from some of the fluids and the, the bodily juices that are inside the animal if you if you did happen to hit the wrong part 
and sometimes that's beyond your control. I mean, ideally, we all want a quick, clean harvest. In the real world, it doesn't always happen that way, unfortunately. So you can easily remove anything that may have become tainted or maybe uh, have an off smell or give the meat a bad taste. You just want to get rid of anything that may have been tainted or anything that is sub subpar quality. Mike Hang tight. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. We're talking with Mike Horswell of Jay's Sporting Goods. Mike is an expert. I mean, this guy knows it inside and out when it comes to processing your own uh, wild game. By the way, the website for Jay's is jaysportinggoods.com, jaysportinggoods.com. Congrats to everybody at Jay's on their 50th anniversary. How cool is that? More with Mike Horswell after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Traverse City on WTCM. That's 580 AM. And you can hear us on the other side of the state in Tawas, WIOS, AM and FM, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Rapid River Knife Works. Chris Durson and crew do a wonderful job of making handmade, custom-made in some cases, Pieces of art that are functional working knives. Chris, Chris told me, I don't care how beautiful our knives are. Please use them. Don't put them up on a, on a shelf. Don't hang them on the wall. Put them in your pocket. Put them on your belt. Put them in a sheath and use these things. And I do. I use my Rapid River Knife every day. Uh, the website is RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. And there is a promotion going on right now between Rapid River and Michigan Brand. If you go, uh, there's a post on the Rapid River Knife Works Facebook page and the uh, Michigan Brand Facebook page. If you like that post and comment, you will be registered to win an engraved Rapid River knife that we're giving away Wednesday night, October 20th, during a Wednesday night live at the Rapid River showroom uh, in Rapid River in the UP. So, so if you want a Rapid River Knife, I would encourage you to uh, get involved in that contest. Again, the website, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. By the way, the folks at Jay's Sporty Goods have Rapid River Knives as well. And I bring up Jay's because my guest right now, Mike Horswell, of, uh, is uh, uh, an employee of Jay's Sporting Goods. But he's wearing his uh, venison processing hat right now. Um, Mike, I'm a little bit concerned with these warm temps that we're having right now, as we often do early in the October bow season. What kind of a concern is that? Well, it's something to be well aware of. You don't want to ruin the integrity of that meat by having it spoil. However, if you do have a place where you can put the carcass or hang the animal and leave the hide on, I mean, even if it's up in the 70s during the day, if it gets down in the 40s to 50s at night and you're in a shaded shed, then it'll still keep that cool enough to get you by for a few days. I know a lot of guys like to skin their animal when it's warm. It's a lot easier. The hide comes off easy, but you lose a lot of protection on that meat. So I prefer to leave the hide on until I'm ready to actually quarter up the animal and get it off the bone. So leaving the hide on and leaving it in a cool, shaded shed We'll get you by just fine. If you have access to a walk-in cooler or a cool room, of course, that's ideal. Uh, under most extreme conditions, if it's really hot out and you don't have any choice, there's nothing wrong with getting that hide off the animal, get the animal quartered up off the bone, and then at that point you can refrigerate the quarters, and that'll get you by, buy you some more time. If you're out in a remote area at camp, you don't have the luxury of a building, a cooler, or anything like that. You can get game bags. They're a white cloth game bag. They're made out of, like, cheesecloth. That's a great way to keep the flies and keep insects off there. Your biggest enemy is going to be flies getting on the meat and burrowing those eggs in there, and that's, of course, where you get the, the maggots and the spoilage come oh, from. Man. So keeping the flies off with those game bags, you can get a big pack of game bags, enough for a whole big game carcass for under $15. So that's a great little bit of uh, insurance for you. 
ideally, though, if Mother Nature will allow, you like to leave the hide on, you like to hang them. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there are different schools of thought on how long you should hang or age a deer. What do you think, Mike? I like going with a solid five to seven days. I've hung them uh, as long as it doesn't get frozen solid, like in November during the firearm season. It's ideal hanging weather typically. Of course, you don't want the animal to get frozen solid, but if it's uh, above freezing and it's nice and cool, there's no problem with it hanging seven to ten days even. I like a solid three to four day hang if possible, and with I think four to six days being the optimum in my opinion with the hide on. That just keeps the meat preserved nicely. It allows it to bleed out well. It allows the muscle fibers to start breaking down a little bit and you get a lot better result. Why do you not want it to freeze? Just because it's harder to work with at that point? Much harder to work with, yes. Yeah, it, it does not help. I've I've cut up several that did get frozen solid on me, and uh, it really is no fun. I mean, uh, I you bet. might need to bring it in, have it uh, wrapped in a tarp or something. You'll need to take it in where it's warm, or if you have a heated garage, you might need to thaw it out a little bit. But I don't really think it helps the quality of the meat for it to freeze and thaw and then freeze and thaw. I really I haven't had a good experience with that because it doesn't allow the blood and the bodily fluids to really drain out properly. When it gets froze up like that, that's when the drainage quits. So it's better to have it where it can drain out and just slowly start to break down those muscles. So I believe it helps if you can keep it from freezing solid. When you hang a deer, do you hang it head up or head down, or does it matter? Well, you can do it either way. I've found that hanging it head down is much better, and there's two reasons for that. It's much easier to skin the animal if you get yourself a gambrel hook and put it through the hocks of the hind legs. You can start skinning it around the knee, cut the tail off, and then the hide pulls right down toward the head. It's much easier to get around the front shoulders. If you hang it from the head, you've got to start just below the chin, around the neck. You get hair all over the brisket. You get it all over the neck. It's very challenging to get it around the front shoulders, whereas if you go from the hind end, you've got all that hide coming down. It's much easier to get around the front shoulders, and when you get it down to the head, you cut the head off. You've got a clean, workable carcass with hardly any hair on it, Mm -hmm. and the bodily fluids all work from gravity, so therefore, if you hang it from the head, all that blood, all the bodily fluids are going down into your hind quarters where most of your prime steaks and your better cuts are at. Mike, how much processed venison are we going to get from the average Michigan whitetail? You're going to get about, it's less than 50% of the hanging weight. Uh, I recommend everybody get a big game scale. It really opened our eyes, and it really helps uh, you have a better idea of what you're dealing with when you can weigh your animals. Most of the yearling bucks in mid-Michigan where I live, they're going to weigh out anywhere from 95 to 115 pounds. You know, if you get a yearling spike or fork horn that goes 110, 115, that's a good one. You know, most of your uh, two-and-a-half, three-and-a-half, even bigger bucks are going to push the scales about 170 to 180. I think the heaviest deer I've had on my scale was an Isabella County Farm 12 point, and that was at 197 pounds dressed, which was an absolute brute. So, <laughs> well, hold on a second. Um, you're telling me as many deer as you've processed, 197 is one of the biggest you've ever seen. But Mike, I hear I hear stories about 200 pound Michigan whitetails all the time. Well, these are guys that are. Uh, dragging them out of the swamp (laughs) and they swear they got to be at least 200 pounds but i'll tell you what when you get a scale and you start weighing them you'll have a much better idea what a field dressed deer actually weighs and there are those big bruiser bucks out there but uh, until you start weighing them you really get an idea so on your yearling bucks you know your 100 110 pound buck you're going to get maybe 30 30 to 40 pounds of prime boneless, usable meat with all the fat cap and all the connective tissue trimmed off, you know. So you can expect about probably 35, maybe 40 pounds of meat on a clean kill yearling buck. And, you know, for some families, that'll get them through the whole year. Sure. If it's all prime meat, it's all clean. There's no fat on it. There's no bone in there. 
it's all good usable meat. And if you make your burger, if you want to add some uh, pork shoulder to it, or when you make your salami, you add a little bit of pork there. So, I mean, you gain poundage. If you make, I like making breakfast sausage. I make a farm style breakfast sausage. I add pork shoulder to that, to the venison, and that makes an awesome breakfast sausage. So you can actually supplement your poundage by adding some quality pork or whatever you choose to put in there. Some people have added beef suet to their burger and they like that. I'm personally not a fan of that myself. I'd rather use a high quality pork shoulder to add the fat and make the meat stick together, give you a little bit of grease in the pan and just keep it from being too dry. But you can add to your poundage by just adding a high quality pork to it as well. You know, you bring up the the concept of uh, putting stuff in your burger Man, you put the wrong stuff in there, and you could take that beautiful, wonderful venison and, and give it a whole different taste. Yes, yeah, so you can actually ruin it. I know uh, my family is originally from the western UP, and my mother was always put off by venison before we started processing our own. Because as a child, they would put beef tallow and just straight up suet in their venison for two reasons. One reason to give it fat. Another reason to make the meat go further yeah. because times were tough and they wanted to make that meat stretch out as far as they could as a food source. Well, there were chunks of suet, chunks of this. They, they didn't get all the venison tallow off it. Uh, you get that fat in there, that'll give it an off flavor. It's just, it's not very uh, palatable. So I stay away from straight up suet. There are some types of beef fat you can get from the commercial processors that are a great additive. You just want to make sure you break it down really well. When I first started doing it, I would just go to the store and I would get cheap beef hamburger and add it to my venison burger. But then all the bacteria came along. You didn't know you didn't, like you said, you don't want to contaminate your prime venison by putting some off-grade beef in it. So I found a high-quality pork shoulder provides fat it gives it a good flavor it really helps with the quality of the meat some people just prefer to leave it straight up ground venison and there's nothing wrong with that you can still use it for everything you'd use regular ground meat for it just maybe if you're going to patty it up and make a burger patty out of it it may want to be crumbly it may not be you know as juicy as it would be if you added some pork or something but as far as your sauces spaghetti sauce sloppy joes tacos that type of thing just straight up ground venison is great. I had a friend who was health conscious. He added ground turkey to his ground venison, and that actually moistened it up enough and served as a binder to help hold it together, and he got a very good, healthy result with ground turkey added to his. I know when our kids were little, we used to just grind up just straight venison, nothing else, nothing else in it. One mm-hmm. year at the end of the summer, we ran out of uh, a venison burger, and we got some from the store and cooked it up, and the kids wouldn't eat it. They're like, what is this greasy, smelly stuff? We're not used to this. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a broad range of acceptance out there for ground meats, and you really need to be discriminatory when you are going to get ground meat, especially when you're adding it to that prime venison. I mean, get a high-quality meat by all means. Don't skimp on it or go low-end because it's not going to help the quality of your meat. My course, well, always great advice. Uh, you have a wonderful season. I look forward to seeing a picture of that big buck you're going to send me. Sounds good, Mike. Thank you for having me on the show. Always a pleasure. Mike Horswell of Jay's Sporting Goods, the website jaysportinggoods.com. That's jaysportinggoods.com. We'll take a break. When we come back, Brian Roll talking about the number of whitetails in the UP. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, AM and FM, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Houghton Lake on 98.5 WUPS. And you can hear us in Holland on WHTC, AM and FM, 1450 AM and 99.7 FM. Want to uh, turn our attention now to the UP, the beautiful UP. Brian Roll is a DNR wildlife biologist uh, from the UP. He joins us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Brian, welcome. How are you? 
Oh, doing good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, listen, a real pleasure. So, uh, what's on the agenda? What are we? What are we talking about this time, Brian? Uh, well, we put together a report looking at all the limiting factors on deer abundance in the Upper Peninsula, and it's it's just got posted um, very recently to our website. So, it really looks at all those factors from wolf predation, winter weather, predation by other species, habitat quality. I mean, even changes to deer harvest regulations um, and the declining hunter numbers, changes to the timber harvest. I mean, all this plays a role in that deer population in, in the Upper Peninsula. So it's a really long report. It's, I don't know, 25, 30 pages. But we did make a two-page quick summary for those folks that didn't really want to dive into the whole thing. But it's a really interesting paper, and I think it sheds a lot of light um, on what's going on in the Upper Peninsula for deer. It sounds maybe like you're not painting a very bright picture, though. Uh, well, no. I mean, we just kind of put some realistic um, factors on what's limiting deer. Um, you know, deer in the Upper Peninsula are really driven by winter weather. And I know I hear the argument that, um, you know, we've always had harsh winters in the Upper Peninsula. And that certainly is true. However, when you look recently, the frequency of these severe weather has really increased, particularly since 1996, where we've had two experiences where we had two back-to-back and even two where we had three consecutive winters. It, it really is kind of looking, this whole report is kind of looking at it all encompassing on what's really driving it because, of course, we hear a lot that wolves are taking all the deer. So we wanted to look at all the limiting factors on the deer. Um, and like I said, winter weather is what's really driving this deer herd and that frequency of severe weather for deer. Um, wolves are part of it. What I always kind of say is wolves are a piece of the pie, just not the whole pie. And so it really looks at all these factors and kind of puts a realistic numbers um, into what's actually going on with our deer population. Wind, winter weather, wolves, and then uh, habitat, loss of deer yards, is, is that a factor as well? Oh, deer yard is huge. In fact, I mean, deer, I mean, right behind winter weather, I'd put loss of deer wintering habitat as the next factor. Um, if we were ranking them, wolves and even predation are really pretty low on the list. Uh, wolves in particular, coyotes and bears actually have a bigger impact on deer population in the Upper Peninsula simply because there's so many more. Now, they're like when you look at fawn survival, and that's really what drives our deer herd is the, the um, fawn survival. Um, the predation on fawns by black bear and coyote is low. But because you have such a higher number of those on the landscape, their factor is greater than wolves or, say, bobcats. Actually, bobcats have the highest predation rate on fawns. Um, but, you know, I guess luckily for the deer herd and for the deer hunters, we don't have all that many bobcats in the UPs. So their their total impact isn't as great as, say, coyotes is. I know it's going to vary from region to region from one part of the up to the other but in general what are michigan deer hunters up deer hunters going to going to find this year brian oh this year we're actually um i think we're going to be on the upswing uh, we had an extremely mild weather um last winter so that's going to put more deer on the landscape and likely you're going to see more year and a half old bucks just because their survival was so much greater and probably a few extra two and a half year old deer um, after that, because of the three previous consecutive um, severe weather, we're still not going to see all that many of the uh, three and a half, four and a year half old bucks. But overall, you're certainly going to see more deer than you did last year if you're out hunting. Real quick, and I, 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 it's almost unfair to ask you this question this late, but why was it back in the old days, the 50s and 60s, the deer population was in the UP, not the southern lower, and now it's almost flipped? What, what has changed, Brian? Um, habitat. Um, you know, we can't carry the same number of deer that we once did. When you look at hemlock which, and cedar, hemlock in particular is just an important species, uh, tree species for deer survival. And since the 1850s, we've had like a 97% decline in our hemlock in the Upper Peninsula. So we don't have the deer wintering complexes that we once had. So we can't carry those same number of deer. 
Um, also, it's just the sheer number of hunters. Um, you know, and then when you get into the northern lower and you start getting into agricultural belt, of course, you're, you know, putting a lot more food on the ground for those deer, uh, making it, um, you know, some very healthy deer at high um, fawn survival rates. All right, Brian, listen, I appreciate that insight. I'll send people to the website, michigan.gov slash DNR, and the Facebook page where they can find that report that you're talking about. And I'll look forward to talking again soon. Sure. Anytime. All right. Brian Roll, uh, DNR wildlife biologist from the UP, the website michigan.gov slash DNR, and the Facebook page. Look for that uh, report Brian was talking about. I'll, I will find that, by the way. I'll find it, and I'll post it to, the, uh, uh, to my Facebook page as well. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, wrap up this second hour with this week's Ask Avery segment. We're going to continue on with the DNR, this time Chad Stewart talking about the EHD outbreak in the southern part of the state. How bad is it? We'll find out right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Lansing on WILS, 1320 AM. In uh, Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. And you can hear us in Port Huron on WPHM, 1380 AM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoorsmen and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way the Ask Avery segment works is this is your chance to get involved in the content of the program. You can send me a question that you want me to, uh, to answer directly, or you can, you can use me as a conduit to get to a, a question to somebody else, maybe somebody in the DNR or MUCC or you know, wherever else. This week is a question that comes from several different people. And it's a question I've been wondering about myself as well. It's the idea, the topic of this EHD outbreak in the southern part of the state. When I first heard about it, I thought, nah, it's no big deal. But then I started hearing about more reports in different counties, and it got me wondering, how big of a deal is this? So to find out, we'll go right to the source. Chad Stewart, the big game specialist for the DNR, joins us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Chad, welcome back. How you doing? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So what's 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 up? What's the status? So with, you know, as it pertains to EHD, we, we are experiencing an outbreak. Uh, most of the reports so far are coming out of the southeastern part of the state. So we've confirmed um, EHD, which um, is an acronym for epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Um, we've confirmed it in four counties so far. Um, most of the reports seem to be coming out of Oakland County. But we've also confirmed it in Macomb, St. Clair, and Shiawassee County. Um, So there are are definitely places that are probably going to be impacted this hunting season um, from a a hunter's perspective because deer are dying because of hemorrhagic disease. Um, The good news is that once we get some sort of a frost, that should should shut down the, the transmission cycle. Nothing out of Kalamazoo or Branch? Because I got some reports from hunters there who said they had uh, deer dying on their property as well. So we, we've we not confirmed it there. Um, it it's needs to be a test to confirm it. Um, certainly we, there are probably some other uh, counties that we've gotten that it is being reported in, but we haven't been able to confirm it. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if those counties are experiencing a small outbreak as well. Um, we just we just haven't confirmed it yet, so we can't go on, on record and saying we have it there. And how does this compare to the big outbreak a few years ago? Uh, so, so far, it, it, it probably won't amount to that same level. You know, back in 2012 is, is the year that everybody remembers. Um, you know, I, I wasn't in Michigan yet, but, you know, I was in Indiana, but we were confirming hemorrhagic disease in deer in July, which is incredibly early. So you can imagine the time frame to get from a hard frost that kills the that that stops the transmission cycle um, from July versus when it starts here in in mid to late September um, is is a lot different. So, 
there are definitely going to be certain areas that are impacted and, and people will see fewer deer, um, but it won't have near the, the range um, that, that we saw in 2012 when we had that really bad outbreak. And this is uh, related to or, or completely weather dependent, right? So it's, it's based on um, a transmission cycle with, uh, you know, one of these no seam kind of bugs. You know, we call them midges. Um, and, and typically in, in years where you have a lot more mud flats, which is prime for their breeding cycle, and that, that could be drought, it could be exceptional floods, anything that sort of creates a lot of mud flats, which is the ideal breeding habitat for those midges, uh, you tend to see a little bit of a, a boom in EHD outbreak, and, and, and that's probably what we're seeing here. It's, it's probably related to weather factors throughout the summer. Um, always fatal to deer? They can't, they can't recover from this, can they? Uh, they actually can. Um, it's, I would say it's usually fatal to okay. deer. Um, so typically once they get it, they, they, they do succumb to it. But um, unlike something like chronic wasting disease, which is a, a fatal disease, once you get it, if something else doesn't kill you before, like you're going to die from chronic wasting disease, Deer can recover from hemorrhagic disease. Um, The cycle for hemorrhagic disease just works so much faster than what you see with chronic wasting disease. So within a week to two weeks, you can have an animal that is um, between getting infected and being symptomatic with the disease, whereas chronic wasting disease takes years for that to happen. But uh, you you do see deer recover, and actually a good way to see if your deer maybe recovered from hemorrhagic disease this fall is if you harvest a deer, especially in those areas, is to look at their hooves. Um, so what you see is like a growth interruption on all four hooves, and actually it starts to either break off or slough off because that, that shows that they were fighting a, an infection at that time, and then it started to regrow. So hmm. you can usually tell if an animal has recovered from hemorrhagic disease in the fall simply by looking at their hooves. Hmm. All right, Chad, always good information. I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that it's, it's, it's not going to be to the extent that it was a few years ago at least. Some people will definitely be impacted, and, and to those people, you know, it's it's really unfortunate, but it, it won't have the wide-ranging scale that we saw in, you know, about 10 years ago. That that, that cycle started way earlier in the summer and is going to impact a lot more deer. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be on that same timeline, but some people are definitely going to have impacts for sure. All right, Chad, appreciate your time. Chad Stewart of the DNR, the website michigan.gov slash DNR. And a big thank you, as always, to the uh, folks at Security Credit Union for helping to make each week's Ask Avery segment possible. If you want to send me a question for the segment, best way to do it, I think, is send me an email. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back in hour number three, Lance Valentine of Teach and Fishing. For Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery, and uh, welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine Radio Network as we kick off the month of Rocktober. I love October. I, my favorite time of the year. Absolute favorite time of the year. Hey, listen, before we get into this hour, I want to follow up on a topic at the end of hour number two. And the the experts will tell you, don't do this, right? The broadcast consultants, the experts, well, you know what? Uh, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, Chad Stewart from the DNR, we were talking in the Ask Avery segment at the end of the last hour about the uh, EHD outbreak in whitetails in the southern part of the state. He sent me a text once we got out there. He said, uh, something I, I missed in saying is that uh, uh, deer can be reported through our website, michigan.gov slash eyes in the field. 
And if somebody sees a deer that you think has died from EHD, uh, report it, and they'll try to get somebody out there to uh, confirm it. But the website, michigan.gov slash eyes in the field, if you think or if you're convinced because you know it's your property, uh, that you've got an EHD outbreak on your property. And again, as soon as we get a good killing frost, uh, it'll take care of this situation. A good killing frost will take care of my allergies, too. So I'm, I'm ready for a good killing frost. Going back to uh, the month of Rocktober, I love Rocktober. The hunting seasons are in full swing. Uh, trophy fishing in the fall is some of the best it's going to be. Now, I... I took my Angler Quest, my A26 Pro Troll, across Saginaw Bay the other day and took it over to Linwood Beach Marina to get her winterized because I'm done. I, I, you know, I have great plans of going fishing in the fall, and I ever do. I never do. But I posted on my Facebook page that, that I was done, and I had somebody respond. They said, hey, I know who can take you out fishing. And the guy that responded was Lance Valentine. <laughs> I... I fished with Lance last spring down in the Detroit River. I have not fished with Lance, believe it or not, ever trolling the big water for walleye. This would be a great time to take him up on his offer because fall is a great time to catch trophy fish. Lance Valentine of Teaching Fishing, uh, welcome back, my friend. How are you? I am fantastic. I've got the same allergy problem you have. Oh, man. (laughs) I I am definitely waiting for that first frost to... uh, to say I can actually sleep and be able to breathe for the next couple of days. But, uh, you know, getting excited here. I'm actually uh, in my office today putting together a seminar for uh, the month of October for our Teaching Fish and Anglers Club. And the title of the seminar is Trophy Fall Walleye, Making the Right Adjustments to Catch More. So wow. uh, fall walleye is definitely on my mind today. And uh, for the next uh, two, two and a half months, we're going to be concentrating on catching those big, giant fish that uh, – that the fall produces two months. I mean, you're talking right up until almost ice up. Yeah, uh, we're going to be on Saginaw Bay until we can't get on it anymore. We'll, we'll, we'll take a, about a two and a half week uh, foray down to Lake Erie, and uh, when we kind of wrap that up, we'll come back for about a week and a half on Saginaw Bay. Then we're going to go back to Erie the end of November to get the last three or four days of the big uh, fishing derbies they have down there because the winning fish every year is caught after thanksgiving so we'll be down there right after thanksgiving for the next three four days the, the final three days of those two derbies to try to win a hundred thousand dollar boat in both of those derbies and then we'll be back up here on saginaw bay until ice says we can't go fishing anymore so we stay at it right up until uh actually the last minute and sometimes we'll pass the last minute <laughs> <laughs> why, why is the big fish caught that late is because they've had just that much more time to feed to put weight on yeah so you know this time of year these fish are uh you know they're, they're just feeding so mother nature tells them look at we've got winter coming up we've got pre-spawn coming up we've got spawn coming up uh you're not going to get any more bait so right now every bait fish that gets eaten is gone forever so we're not replenishing bait like we do in the spring and the summertime so as bait gets less and less and less and these fish are being told by mother nature that you need to eat everything you can eat they start to go on these feeding frenzies, and, and they will just get fat and fat, and they will eat, and they will eat, and they will eat, and they'll bite a lure as they're regurgitating four or five, you know, five-inch shad. They are absolutely 100% aggressive, and as the water gets colder and we get closer to ice up and closer to the shutdown uh, of, of the biosystem as we get into, you know, wintertime and we get snow and ice cover, these fish are on the prowl. They're, they're the fattest they're going to be all year. That kind of helps the deal, and you start to get big fish starting to separate by size and be together. So if you can get on a big fish bite, chances are pretty good. There's multiple big fish right in that same area, in that same pod traveling with each other. So uh, it's definitely the time, and as it gets colder, these things get more and more pronounced. So as we go later and later in the season, our chance of catching a big fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you, you mentioned fish schooling by size. Does that not happen in the summertime as much? Uh, it doesn't happen as much in the summer. We lo- we like to see it happen. If you see it happen, which honestly it should happen, because you know a 16 inch walleye isn't going to eat the same thing a 29 inch walleye is. Right? They they have different food preferences. So usually, if you see the fish that aren't separated by size, 
that should put a little red flag up that we have an issue with the biomass, we have an issue with the bait fish. But uh, it's not as pronounced in the summertime as it is in the fall. Uh, there's, you know, there's bait fish in the fall from, you know, two inches to five, six, seven inches. A lot of the big walleyes we catch in the fall, Saginaw Bay, Lake Erie, Detroit River, Saginaw River, they are eating five, six, seven, eight, nine-inch shad, and they will have five, six, seven, eight of them in their stomach when you when you clean those fish. I've got a picture of a 26-and-a-half-inch walleye that had 14 shad in its belly, and the smallest <laughs> shad was three-and-a-half inches. So these fish don't stop. And, you know, again, it's easier to get one or two big meals than it is to catch a bunch of small bait fish. So these big fish are not only feeding, but they also need to consume or conserve energy. So the better chance they have of getting more protein, a better meal with less extension of energy, they're going to do that. So they definitely separate by size. You know, the the fisheries, the bodies of water you talked about, are all on the east side of the state. Does this topic extend over to the west side, the Drown River mouths over there? Does it extend up to the UP, the Bays de Noc up in the UP as well? Absolutely. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, my, my gut feeling is uh, when, not if, when we break the state uh, record for wallet, it will be done on the west side. It will be one of those drowned river mouths. It will be with the right wind conditions. It will be right off of the pier, maybe someone even casting off the pier. Because um, you look at some of the walleyes that are caught every year by the salmon and steelhead guys that uh, are caught when they're out of season, those fish live in Lake Michigan. There are 17, 18, 19-pound walleyes that live in Lake Michigan, and they make forays into those drowned river mouths and the drowned river mouth lakes that are attached to the lake. There are a lot of huge walleye over there, and I think the next big walleye that we see, the next big walleye news is going to come from that side of the state. The problem is there aren't as many. For every 10-pound walleye on the west side, there's probably 30 in Lake Erie and probably six or seven, maybe even 10 in Saginaw Bay. So the numbers are much bigger over here. The chance for a huge fish is a lot better over on the west side of the state. Well, Lance, a new state record would be something, as you well know, over 17-3. That would be something else. They are definitely. I guarantee you there's one, at least one, somewhere around Lake Michigan. You know, and it's funny, you know, we think of Lake Erie as this huge walleye factory, which it is. Uh, the Ohio state record is actually smaller than the Michigan state record. So um, because of the way Lake Erie actually functions, you don't get a chance to grow a lot of big, big, big walleye because there's not a lot of cold water. So these fish actually, they, they kind of max out in weight before they can max out in length. Lake Michigan, a little bit different. These fish can get in cold water. They can grow longer, which means they can hold more mass. So I think we're going to see, again, we're going to see, a, a state record, I think fairly quickly because more people are fishing for walleye on the west side of the state and more fish, more people are fishing smarter for walleye on the west side of the state. We're getting a lot more knowledge about how these fish work. There's a lot of great fishermen over there that are spending more time over there working on just finding that fish of a lifetime as opposed to just catching uh, a limit every time they go out. So I, I would expect that in the next two or three years, I wouldn't be surprised to see an 18, 19 pound walleye come out of the west side of the state. Oh, that would be so cool. I mean, look at the attention the new state record King got after being broken for so many years. A walleye would be the same thing. I think the walleye would be a lot more because I think it would be, it would garner a lot more national attention. Um, you know, salmon fishing is a very small pocket of salmon fishing. And, you know, everybody nowadays walleye fishes. You know, mm-hmm. you're talking about guys in Kentucky and Tennessee and Arkansas. Uh, if you could break a state record up here, especially if you could get to that 20-pound uh, number, uh, you would have national attention. Uh, boy, get me excited. Maybe I need to spend more time on the west side of the state. That's, you you, that's, you, you that's want to get done with this so you can go fishing now, don't you? <laughs> hey, listen, Lance, hang tight. We've got to take a break here on the Outdoor yeah. Magazine Show. We're talking with Lance Valentine of Teaching Fishing, the website teachingfishing.com, teachingfishing.com. Uh, after we come back, uh, Lance uh, mentioned a little bit about his uh, his on the water uh, events he has down on Lake Erie. I want to talk more about that. I think there's still time for you to get involved if you want to. I'll make sure to follow up on that. And uh, Lance is a really interesting guy. He's one of those guys that when he talks about fishing, I go, "Well, yeah, that makes so much sense." But I never would have gone down that mental track if Lance hadn't taken me there. 
Um, and if you've talked to him, if you've met him in person, you know exactly what I mean. The website, teachandfishing.com, teachandfishing.com. More with Lance Valentine right here on Outdoor Magazine coming up after the break. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistee on WMLQ 97.7 FM. And you can hear us in the thumb on WMIC in Sandusky. That's 660 AM and 95.3 FM. Uh, This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Wilds Plumbing and Heating. Plumbing, heating, air conditioning, sump pumps, ductwork cleaning, you name it. The folks at Wilds are are dedicated to keep your house running smoothly, efficiently, to keep you comfortable. Their their slogan, their motto is whatever it takes. I've got to respect a company who has that kind of a motto, whatever it takes. And I've seen that in my own dealing with the folks at Wilds. If you have a problem, they will come out and they will take care of it as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Check them out online at wildsplumbingandheating.com. That's wildsplumbingandheating.com. Uh, while you're online, please check out my website, mikeeveryoutdoors.com, and then head on over to teachandfishing.com. Uh, one of the places you'll find Lance Valentine uh, online this time of year, you'll find him in person chasing trophy walleye on uh, Lake Erie, uh, Saginaw Bay, but the topics, the techniques, the tactics he's talking about pertain to big water across the state. Um, uh, Lance, uh, you you mentioned earlier about something you were doing for your members, and then your outing, I think, is for members as well. How does this all work? What is this teach and fishing community? Um, How does it work? Right, so we've got we've got uh, uh, multiple ways. We do a lot of stuff. We have a Facebook page called the Teaching Fishing Educational Forum that's open to anybody, and we have a lot of content there. Uh, obviously, our Teaching Fishing YouTube channel has a bunch of videos and a bunch of education uh, there. But then we have the, what we call the Teaching Fishing Anglers Club, and that is uh, guys they they pay a yearly fee to be part of that, and we do exclusive content for them every every month. So. Uh, they get three to four pieces of content, uh, seminars, workshops, uh, live question and answer sessions with me. Um, they get exclusive content just for the Angers Club every month. Um, so that's kind of the, the next step. Those guys who, you know, they, they've been around the Internet. And, and as you know, there's, there's a ton of information on the Internet, but there's not a lot of good information. So uh, after guys kind of go through the Internet and see all the free stuff and all this and all that, they go, you know, I really want to kind of hone this in. Uh, and that's where we get most of our members, the guys who have spent some time looking at fishing information but really want the real deal. So that's our Anglers Club. And then our Fishing Education Weekend is our on-the-water uh, kind of a chance to get together, share as a group, and fish together and get a chance to uh, take advantage of this fall fishing. And that's open to anybody. That's open to the public. Uh, we do fishing every day. We do uh, one fishing seminar and then a, a short little workshop every morning after breakfast. Then we do one or two workshops in the afternoon and then a seminar at night. And in between that is fishing time. Uh, we, we provide everything, meals, lodgings, all the seminar speakers, um, everything you need other than your fishing. And that is, you know, that's the only thing you have to pay for extra. That's the, that's the fishing education weekend. And what that is is the ability to get guys in one place or anglers in one place Go on the water, learn some stuff when they get there Thursday, go on the water Friday, come back and say, okay, I struggled with this, I don't understand this, I'm having a hard time with this. Do another seminar, talk to them individually and help them work it. Then they can go back on the water Saturday and work at it. So not only are we trying to help educate them and get them better at what they're doing, but we're also sharing fishing information on the water. So if somebody's catching fish, uh, you know, five miles east of where we launch, they're going to share all that information as it happens live with the rest of the guys in our fishing education weekend, and the other anglers can make adjustments. And then we try to teach them that uh, even though you may be five miles away, you don't need to drive your boat five miles to where that guy is fishing. Listen to what he's telling you. You may be three or four foot too deep or too shallow or have the wrong style lure or going the wrong speed. Make those adjustments where you are, and chances are pretty good you can actually catch fish too. 
So we try to teach folks not only how to fish, uh, to hone their uh, their abilities on the water, how to concentrate on catching big fish in the fall, but we also teach them kind of very subtly how to actually gather and analyze fishing information to actually use to their betterment. So uh, a lot going on. We've got some great speakers. Mark Panazak, uh, you got you know from uh, Saginaw Bay, is going to come and do a seminar on fall walleye, how they're different than regular uh, fishing, regular walleyes, how big walleyes in the fall are different than normal walleye. Our good friend Ali Shakur is going to come and talk about how current concentrates fish. Now you have to pay attention to how fast your lures are actually going below the water, not necessarily your speed over ground, how current affects how fish locate and the speed of your lure. And then our good friend Travis Harbin from the Ohio DNR is going to do a seminar Thursday. Uh, We haven't seen Travis in three years due to COVID, but he's going to come and fill us in. He does a great seminar with all the fish they track. They've got over close to 1,000 fish right now with radio transmitters in Lake Erie. And he gives us a full rundown of all the tracking studies they've done over the last couple of years. It's amazing to see how these fish, they can actually get, get find the same fish, will make the same migration through the same two transmitters <laughs> every spring on the way out west to east and every fall on the way back east to west. Wow. So that helps kind of solidify the things we teach guys to use with their GPS. They have waypoints every time you catch a fish, and those patterns actually do hold up when the conditions are the same. So... It's not just fishing. There is a whole lot going on. Our fishing education weekends open to the public. Uh, sign up is available at teachingfishing.com right on the homepage. Mark Bonanzac, Ali Shakur, uh, Lance Valentine, and more. <laughs> you, you put together a pretty all star lineup. I'll tell you what, guys leave their Sunday. We have a lot of folks that, you know, they, they come in Thursday, and by the time they eat breakfast Sunday, this is a true story. We have a lot of guys that go, I just can't do this anymore. I just, I just, I just can't. I can't. I've had enough. I'm just going to have another cup of coffee and pack up and go home because we absolutely inundate them with information. It is, it is one of the best ways to learn uh, not only how to catch fall walleye, but how to learn the process of fishing, our eight steps. Uh, you know, and, again, the biggest thing is getting and analyzing fishing information on the water and being able to use it to your advantage. That's one of the things that we definitely teach when we're down here in the fall. When is this weekend, Lance? We haven't even talked so, about that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's always the first weekend of November. So uh, this year it's uh, November 4th through the 7th. Uh, we try to do it late enough so we get the right water temperature. 55 degrees and lower is kind of the water temperature. We need to get a really good bite. Uh, so we usually have that, and then we try to get it far enough ahead that guys can take the weekend off and still be back home for uh, opening the deer season. So uh, first weekend of November this year, it's actually November 4th to the 7th, and we hold it in Huron, Ohio, uh, which is just uh, about 15, 16 miles east of Sandusky, uh, Cedar Point. So we're right down there in the, the hotbed of fall fishing for uh, for Lake Erie. You mentioned water temp. That's got to be uh, a, a big factor in the fall as those temps are changing. Yeah, it, it's huge. You know, I, I break fall down in, in basically three different water temperatures. You know, 60 degrees is kind of the start of fall. We're definitely starting to see migrations from flats to steep areas. You know, fish are starting to move towards areas of current influence or wind influence. They're definitely coming off flats and going to steep areas. Uh, That's at 60 degrees. At 55, that movement has definitely happened, and the aggressive feeding, you know, kind of all 24-hour day feeding has started at 55 degrees. And at 50 degrees, I tell guys, get up, call in dead because you need to go fishing. When it hits 50, you need to spend every second on the water you can because every time that offshore uh, planter board goes back, it can literally be a 12, 13, 14, 15 pound fish. And that 52, 52 degrees is kind of the trigger that it's on. 50 is call in dead because you need to be fishing. That is the time to maximize your time and get that fish of a lifetime as a fall time. Uh, once we get down below 50 degrees. Lance, you and I talked about this on a recent Angler Quest podcast, but you mentioned the offshore boards made me think of it. You know, I run the tattle flags on Saginaw Bay in the summertime, and I'm used to watching these small fish take the flag back, and it's a big thrill, and I love it. I got to believe these fish you're after in the fall, you really don't need a tattle flag with them, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually what happens is you'll have uh, you know, three or four boards outside. You'll turn around and talk to your buddy or grab a drink of water and look back, and you'll, only, you'll have one left. <laughs> Uh, and that board will show up straight back behind the motor. You can just see the top of it. So, yeah, tattle flags in the fall, uh, even for average size fish, even for four, five, six, seven pound fish, um, 
they are not necessary because these fish are hungry. They are aggressive. And remember, you know, we've talked about this a lot. They're in very concentrated areas. So uh, in the summertime, you may get a school that's got 20, 30 fish in it. In the fall, you're going to have that same small area packed with 100, 150 fish. So not only are they hungry and aggressive, but they're also very competitive. So a lot of times you'll see your board, you know, in the summertime we watch that offshore board kind of slide back and we go, ooh, there's one. A lot of time in the fall, that, that offshore board will literally it'll go back six inches and disappear like a bob. <laughs> Those fish will come out, grab that bait, and go back, and they can't wait to get away from all their other all their other friends. So uh, it's definitely an exciting time to see an offshore board uh, end up straight behind the boat or just disappear like a, like a bobber when you're bluegill fishing. It def, definitely gets your blood pumping. And, and you'll be out here, Lance. You're going to be after these fish right until Mother Nature will not allow you anymore. Yeah, so uh, there, there, there are two big contests in the fall of Lake Erie. One called the fall, the wall, the walleye, the fall brawl, and one called the walleye slam. Uh, each one of those contests has a hundred thousand dollar boat as a grand prize, and they pay down cash prizes down to about tenth or eleventh place. Those contests are always won after Thanksgiving. Uh, the fall, the wall, fall brawl has been going on for ten, eleven years. Uh, the walleye slam has been going on for about four years now. Every year, those contests, that contest is won after Thanksgiving. So we'll be packing up Thanksgiving afternoon. We're going to take a bunch of buddies down for three or four days until the contest. I think the contest ends on the 30th. And we're going to be down there probably fishing 18 to 20 hours a day oh uh, every day from Thanksgiving until the end of uh, uh, the contest. So we can try to try to win those boats. And then once that's done, we're going to bring the Angler Quest back to Saginaw Bay, and we'll be on Saginaw Bay chasing big, fat, big fat fall walleye until uh, until the ice doesn't let us anymore. So yeah, we don't we don't stop. This is uh, this is kind of my passion, kind of my time of year that I, I like to do my fun fishing. I take a lot of friends fishing, a lot of family fishing. Uh, this is my time to really kind of enjoy uh, fun fishing, even though it's a little colder than I like. But again, you know, every time you pick up a rod and see that offshore planter board go back, it literally can be a 12, 13, 14 pound fish. So uh, it's the only time of year you get that uh, uh, that ability, and I take advantage of every single minute I can to get on the water. Lance, why limit yourself to 14 pounds? Think big, my <laughs> friend. Think 18 so you can get that new state record. Oh, uh, boy, I, 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 would, I would love that. And, you know, it's funny you say it because, you know, I'm thinking I need to spend more time. I have a couple friends on the west side. I need to spend more time over there and kind of learning uh, the currents and kind of how those fish move. And uh, I need to spend a little more time over there applying some of the things that we know about, that we've learned over 20 years in Ohio. Um, I need to get over there and learn that because I would, I would really like See, to have that. There you go. That, 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 that's just what you need, another excuse to go fishing. Lance Valentine, <laughs> always a pleasure. Have fun. Hey, listen, I, I, you know, when you get back up on Saginaw Bay late in the year, maybe I can sneak out with you. I think that'd be fun. I'd love to have it. Absolutely would love to have you out there and, and, and get you on some of those big fish. Wonderful. Lance Valentine of Teaching Fish and TeachingFishing.com, TeachingFishing.com. We'll take a break. A few more a few more thoughts as we get ready to close out or wrap up this week's show, and then we will wrap it up with Wild Game Chef Dave Miner. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Muskegon on WKBZ. That's 1090 AM. Uh, you can hear us in the Sioux on ESPN 1400 WKNW. And you can hear us in Saginaw on WSGW, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. I'm in the studios of WSGW right now. For this three hours, we call this part of the building the Outdoor Magazine Studio. Pat Johnston in here with me doing a wonderful job as always. Pat, I do appreciate that. Uh, this segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. It's the time of year when we're in kind of a transition, right? We're in the month of Rocktober. Uh, the summertime activities are pretty much winding down, but you've got a lot of fall activities. You've got cleanup. You've got to blow out your sprinkler systems, maybe some last-minute uh, pruning. Um, and the folks from uh, Reader are doing most of those things for me, and I do appreciate it because it's your... It's your, what do they call it? It's your nature and their nurture. That's a good way of putting it. It's your lawn, your property, but it's their nurturing um, ability and their expertise to take care of those things. Check them out online at readerlandscaping.com. That's readerlandscaping.com. Well, I mentioned it is Rocktober. I think the best month of the year. 
the hunting seasons now are in full swing. A trophy fall fishing that Lance Valentine of Teach and Fishing was talking about in the previous couple of segments. You know, when I hear Lance talk about taking these OR12 offshore boards, which is what I run, and I occasionally, I mean, I've had a big sheep head or even a big pike under the right situation, the right circumstances, bury a board. I never had a wall. <laughs> never had a wall. I do it. That would be fun. It's not going to happen for me this fall. My angler quest is now uh, being put to bed. The folks at Linwood Beach Marina are are, are wrapping her up for the winter time. Uh, but I am excited about this fall bow season. Uh, I'm maybe more excited about deer season this year than I have been in a long time, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, I really don't know why. Um, I, I, I will probably, by the time you hear this show, I probably will have sat in a tree stand on Friday, which is the opener. I say probably because it's going to be just warm enough where I can't get real excited about it. However, it, it was October 1st. So if you can, you, know, you just got to go out and sit in a tree on October 1st or sit in a ground blind or whatever. Listen, if you are going up a tree, I implore you, Please wear a full body harness of some kind. I like Hunter Safety System because I think they're the company that originated this this category. I think they still make the best products out there. And I know these guys personally. They're friends of mine. But if not Hunter Safety System, somebody. There are a lot of good full body harnesses on the market these days. Also, and this is a critical part of this whole tree stand safety concept, some kind of a lifeline. Something to keep you attached to the tree while you're on the way up and you're on the way back down. The way a lifeline works is it's a rope that hangs from the tree above your tree stand to the ground. And you hook into this while you are still on the ground before you ever start to go up a tree, whatever, before you ever start to go up the ladder. You hook into this. You slide this. Uh, it's called a Prusik knot. You slide this up the tree as you climb. You stay hooked into this lifeline as you are getting in the stand and on stand, getting out of stand and coming back down the stand at the end of the hunt. You stay hooked into it from the time you leave the ground till you get back to the ground. And in theory, short of some kind of a catastrophic equipment failure, you can't fall and hit the ground. Now, you could fall and you could slip. And you could fall a couple of feet till your lifeline grabs you and it could scare the heck out of you, but it's not going to kill you. It's not going to break your back, and it's not going to break your legs because you only fell a foot or so. So please, if you're, if you're going to be up a tree, and I, I get the um, appeal of hunting from a tree because as safe as ground blinds are, at least in the past, the, the knock against them has been, well, you can't see very well. It's limited by, uh, uh, visibility. And that, that is true. I get that. But with these new ground blinds, these see-through blinds, like that Wraith 270 from Primal Tree Stands, it does help the visibility. Obviously, you're not up in the air, so you don't get that advantage. But when you sit in these see-through blinds, you can see all the way around you, well, 270 degrees. By the way, if you're interested in trying out one of those wraiths, uh, go to the website primaltreestands.com, primaltreestands.com. Use the promo code AVERY, and you can get one of them for under 200 bucks. Uh, I I'm, I was told just this morning that they were out of stock. However, I'm not sure about that because I ordered one just the other day and I had it delivered. In fact, it's being delivered uh, to Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters down in Ohio. We're going to go down there and hunt with him in just a couple of weeks. So I've got, as far as bow hunts, I'm going to do some hunting locally around my house in Mid Michigan. We are heading down to Ohio to hunt with Bill Piles of Ohio Bow Hunting Outfitters the second week in October. And then I just talked to Johnny Bowler, my friend uh, in the Newberry uh, area up in the UP, uh, or up by Sini. And he invited me up to come and do a, a whitetail hunt with him in the UP. And I think I'm going to take advantage of that. I think it's been a lot of years since I hunted deer in the UP, and I would really like to give that a try again. Also kind of uh, excited about, um, as hesitant and as much trepidation as I had when I, when I made the mental leap from the, uh, the recurve to the crossbow, I am very excited about it. I'm shooting that dart, and it's shooting very well. It's dialed in, uh, extend my range a little bit. I mean, the bow will shoot out past 80 yards and beyond, but I would never shoot an animal that distance. I, you know, 40 yards, 
which realistically is is about the same yardage when I was shooting my uh, compound and shooting it a lot. So, you know, different different tools for different jobs. Uh, we'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, well, I think we're going to wrap up this week's show with Wild Game Chef Dave Miner. Hopefully we can get a sell. Hey, stay with me. We'll find out after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery. So glad to have you along with us, and I do certainly appreciate it. As I've said before, there are there are many, many different types of programs and podcasts and radio and all these other things vying for your attention, and the fact that you hear my voice right now means a lot. It also means a lot to me to have my friend Wild Game Chef Extraordinaire on the show each week. Uh, we've had some some actually some uh, some uh, cell reception problems the last couple of weeks, but I think we've got them this time around. David, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? <laughs> ah, you sound great, my friend. How are you? Good, good. And yourself, Mike? I'm doing real good. I'm real good. You know, it's the month of Rocktober, the best time of the year, in my opinion. Me too. I've been getting ready for uh, the bow season. Got the crossbows all tuned in, ready to go. Excellent. And if we are lucky or blessed or both, we might get some venison on the table. How about a recipe, Dave? Well, we got a venison for us there. We've sold this at the restaurant for 30 plus years, and uh, it's just a great, great dish. So you're going to need, it's kind of a French style, actually. You're going to need about 8 to 10 ounces of tender venison per person. Nice, you know, back straps or the, even the top round whatever part you like to use, a medium onion diced fine, one package of uh, fresh mushrooms sliced thin. If you wanted morels, man, oh, man, that would be just great. Might have some uh, put away. You need one small can of artichoke hearts drained. And uh, if they come whole, you might want to quarter them up instead of the big pieces. So you need one cup or so of diced fresh tomatoes, a jar of brown gravy, beef gravy, a couple ounces of Jim Beam, uh, let's see, about a cup of flour, olive oil to saute with. And if you ever make your own garlic butter, you need a couple of tablespoons. Or you can dice up fine a couple, two or three cloves, and then you're going to use it with fresh butter because that's how you're going to finish this sauce. And you could use, uh, oh, if you'd like some uh, parsley at the end there to top it off to give it a little color, that so much the better. So anyways, what you want to do is take saran wrap, plastic wrap, or a bread bag. Uh, make sure that you use the outside painted uh, spot to pound with. And you want to pound them down. You could use a, a heavy Coca-Cola bottle or a meat mallet or whatever you want to. And what that's going to do is it's going to make it a little more tender and not draw up and pucker when it cooks. So you're going to dredge them in flour and then don't crowd them in the pan, you know, so you could do... Uh, one or two at a time, depending on how big your pan is. Add a little bit of olive oil to a nice hot pan. Brown it on both sides. Leave it very, very rare. Take it out. Add your vegetables, the onions, the mushrooms, the artichoke hearts, and then add the Jim Beam. Simmer that after you flame it off. Do it away from your hood stove. And uh, then you want to add um, the, the brown gravy, the beef gravy, Start to cook that down real fast. You want to reduce this down after you've taken the meat out so you don't cook it anymore. And then uh, it's only going to take maybe five minutes or so to reduce this down by half. Return the meat back into the pan and turn the fire down a little bit or your electric oven, electric stove. And then uh, just heat it up until it's warm. The rare, more rare, the better. Don't overcook. If you're going to cook it, the medium well and well it's just going to get t tough and uh, dry up and so you can top this serve it all real nice and then put parsley on top and whatever your favorite starch would be you know whether it be potatoes or rice or noodles man because you can have some gravy there to put on all of that so it's a good good great super way a real elegant but it's really simple you know to impress your family and friends with this dish mm, it sounds it's wonderful medicine. Sounds wonderful. And again, we want to stress, with venison, you don't want to overcook it. 
this is true. It just venison or elk or uh, antelope, all of them, you want to eat it, moose, caribou, whatever. You want to eat it as rare as possible. And it's very safe, you know. You know, you never get hurt here of anybody with salmonella or anything from wild game like that. The only game that you really need to cook all the way through is what, either a wild boar or bear, right? That's about it. Yep, yep. Why, why is that, Dave? Well, uh, boar and uh, bear, they're, they are kind of in the same family. And they get, in the wild, they get trigonosis, where uh, domestic pork, there's not been a case in a lot, a lot of years. But you want to cook it well done, and the trigonosis will live in uh, the meat there for quite some time in the freezer. I think it's 60 days you should be freezing your meat mm -hmm. of them, too. So, And plus, it, the wild boar is going to be a little tough, so you want to cook it well. The bear, the same thing. Bear, you want to cook in a sauce, uh, liquid, anything, because it dries out so fast. Bear is not one of them uh, meats that you're going to throw a steak on a barbecue. No, 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 no. No, I think the way to eat bear is a bear brats on the grill. Yeah, meatloaf, too. I oh, yeah, I yeah. Bear yeah. meatloaf a lot, you know, and like that, it's a really, really great way to go. All right, David, listen, glad to be back in touch with you. Uh, have a great opener, and we'll talk again soon. You, too. Everybody be safe. Wear a harness in a tree. <laughs> I just talked about that. You're reading my mind. Wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show, as are you, because if you weren't listening There'd be no reason to do this show, and as I've said before, probably every week, then I would have to find something else to do. And at this point in my life, I don't know what that would be. Well, should I should I be a greeter at Jay's? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I can get a position up there where you walk in the door and say, Hi, welcome to Jay's. Mike Avery, glad to see you. You know, that's not a bad idea. But I'll be 70 or 75 before I do that. Check out the website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. You can always reach me by email. 